Uh, it's a privilege to be uh, engaged in a conversation with my uh, colleague Elizabeth Spelke. We go back a long way. Uh, we've been colleagues both at uh, MIT, where I helped attract her, and at Harvard, where she helped attract me. Uh, like uh, most people in my field, I have uh, enormous admiration for Liz's brilliant contributions to our understanding of the origins of cognition. Uh, but we do find ourselves uh, with somewhat different perspectives on a uh, recent issue. And for those of you who've just arrived from Mars, there's been a certain amount of discussion uh, here at Harvard on a particular datum. And that is the underrepresentation of women among tenure track faculty in elite universities in physical science, math, and engineering. And here are some uh, recent figures. Now, uh, as with many issues in psychology, there are three broad classes of explanations. Uh, one can imagine an extreme nature position that males but not females have the talents and temperaments necessary for science. Needless to say, uh, only a madman could believe that, and uh, there aren't any proponents of that position. There's an extreme nurture position that males and females are biologically indistinguishable, and all the relevant sex differences are products of socialization and bias. And then there's an intermediate position that the difference is explainable by some combination of biological differences in average temperaments and talents interacting with socialization and bias. So let me get back to the datum to be explained. In many ways, this is a very exotic phenomenon. Uh, it involves biologically unprepared talents and temperaments. Evolution certainly did not shape any part of the mind in order to be a uh, professor of mechanical engineering at MIT, for example. Uh, and so the datum has nothing to do with basic uh, cognitive processes or those that we use in our everyday lives uh, in school or even at, in most college courses where indeed there are few sex differences. So this datum is not about uh, that kind of performance. We're also talking about extremes of achievement. Uh, most women are not qualified to be math professors at Harvard because most men aren't qualified to be math professors at Harvard. We are talking about uh, extremes in the population. We're talking about a subset of fields, that it is not the case that women are underrepresented to that extent in all academic fields, and certainly not in all prestigious professions. And also, we're talking about a statistical effect. This is such a crucial point that I want to um, uh, discuss it in some detail. Women are nowhere near absent, even from the fields in which they are underrepresented. Uh, and the explanations for the differences must be statistical as well. And here is just a touchstone for this entire discussion. Uh, these are two Gaussian or normal di distributions, bell curves, where this is a, uh, anything that you want to measure. The x-axis, the y-axis is the uh, proportion of people at that ability. This is what it typically looks like when you compare the sexes on any measure in which they differ, namely if we for this example, if we say that this is the male curve and this is the female curve, at it, the means may be different, but at any particular level of the variable, there are always representatives of both genders. Um, so right away, uh, a number of uh, statements that have been made in the events of the last couple of months are simply red herrings uh, that should not have been made by uh, people who understand this, such as the accusation that, for example, President Summers implied that 50% of the brightest minds in America do not have the right aptitude for science, that women just can't cut it, uh, and so on. These are uh, statistically illiterate and have nothing to do with uh, what we're actually discussing. Now, an important corollary of two overlapping normal distributions, one of them is that the normal distribution falls off according to the negative exponential of the square of the difference from the mean. And that means that even with small differences in the means of two distributions, the more extreme the score, the greater the disparity in the numbers. That is, the ratios get more extreme as you go farther out along the tail. If we hold a magnifying glass uh, up to the tails of the distribution, even though they overlap over the bulk of the curve, when you get out to the extremes, the difference between the two curves gets larger and larger. Which means, uh, oh, to give you an example, we know that the distribution of height between men and women uh, overlap. It's not the case that all men are taller than all women. Uh, and at 5 foot 10, uh, there are 30 men for every woman, whereas at 6 feet, there are 2,000 men for uh, every woman. 
Now, the uh, sex differences in cognition tend not to be uh, anything like that, but uh, that's just to reinforce the statistical point. Another important corollary is that tail ratios are affected by differences in variance. And uh, biologists since Darwin have noted that for many traits and many species, males are the more variable gender. So even in cases where the mean for, say, women and the mean for men is the same, the fact that there are more men uh, dispersed at the extremes means that at the tails, the proportion of men would be higher at one tail and higher at the other, uh, some, as it's sometimes uh, summarized, uh, that more prodigies, more idiots. <laughs> so let me, let, me st uh, let me begin with the, the uh, first point in connecting the political issue to the scientific issue, and that is that uh, as economists who study patterns of discrimination have long argued, often to no avail, there's a, a crucial conceptual difference between a difference and discrimination, that a departure from 50, a 50-50 ratio in any profession does not by itself imply discrimination unless the interests and aptitudes are statistically equated. And let me just illustrate that with an example, and I'll use myself. Uh, I am in a field that is, uh, in fact, um, dominated by women. 75% uh, of the uh, main professional association in the study of child language is female, as are majority of the uh, keynote speakers at our main conference. Um, I'm here to tell you that it's not because I was uh, discriminated against. I decided to study language development as opposed to, say, mechanical engineering. Uh, for many reasons. Uh, I don't think that uh, designing a better automobile transmission is, would turn me on as much as uh, figuring out how kids acquire language. And I don't think I'd be as good at it as I am at studying child language. Um, now, all we need to do in order to uh, explain uh, differences uh, without presumably getting anyone uh, upset about possible sexist interpretation, is to, be a lot, to ask whether whatever traits that I have that give me that predisposition are exactly equally distributed statistically among men and among women. For all those of you out there who also are not mechanical engineers, then you should uh, understand what I'm talking about, of both genders. Okay, there are many similarities between the sexes. There are no differences in general intelligence or G. They are exactly the same on the money. Basic categories of cognition, how we negotiate our world and live our everyday life, our concept of objects, number, people, living things, and so on, show no differences. And indeed, in cases where there are differences, there's pretty much as many instances in which men do slightly better than women as in which women do slightly better than men. Just to give you a few examples, men are better at throwing, women are more dexterous. Men are better at mentally rotating shapes, women are better at visual memory. Men are better at problem solving, uh, women are better at mathematical calculation, and on and on and on. But there are six differences that are relevant to this datum. Uh, and uh, the literature is, uh, on this is so enormous that uh, I'm, uh, I can only touch a, a fraction of it. And I'll restrict myself to a few cases where there are enormous data sets or meta-analyses that try to boil down the literature. Uh, people versus things and uh, abstract rule systems. There is a staggering amount of data on this because there's a whole field of psychology and economics that studies people's vocational interests. I bet most people in this room have taken one of those tests at some point in their lives. And there are consistent differences in the kinds of uh, things that appeal to men and women in their ideal job. Uh, I'll just discuss one of them, which is a... a uh, desire to work with people versus things, where there is a enormous, that is a one standard deviation in terms of uh, men over women. Uh, and indeed, this will tend to cause people to gravitate in slightly different directions. For the, uh, the occupation that's strongest at the people end of this continuum is a director of a community services organization. The occupations that are strongest at the things end are physicist, chemist, mathematician, computer programmer, and biologist. Um, and we see this not only in choice of uh, whether to go into, into um, uh, science, but also in which branch of science the sexes go into. Uh, needless to say, from 1970 to 2002, there's been a huge increase in the, in the percentage of uh, degrees awarded to women. But among the PhDs, for example, you find a uh, difference, we'll take the year 2001, that in education, 65% of the doctorates go to women, 54% of social science degrees, 
47% of life science, 26% of physical science, 17% of engineering, which is perfectly predictable by the continuum between people and living things and inanimate objects. And this is pretty much the same in 1980 and 2001, despite changes in absolute numbers. Third, uh, risk. Uh, men are by far the more reckless sex. Uh, in a large meta-analysis involving 150 studies and 100,000 participants, in 14 out of 16 categories of risk-taking, uh, men were overrepresented. Uh, the two sexes were equal on the other two, one of which was, was uh, smoking for uh, obvious reasons. Uh, and two of the largest sex differences were in intellectual risk-taking and participation in a risky experiment. And I think it's because of this that we, in everyday life, we do see such a difference. Men are uh, very much overrepresented in the following category, uh, namely the Darwin Awards, <laughs> commemorating those individuals who ensure the long-term survival of our species by removing themselves from the gene pool in a sublimely idiotic fashion, in which I think virtually all, perhaps all, of the winners are men. Um, fourth, three-dimensional mental transformations, the ability to determine whether these, uh, each of these pairs of objects represents the same three-dimensional shape. Uh, in a, again, I'll appeal to a, um, a meta-analysis, 286 data sets, 100,000 subjects, and the authors say, we have specified a number of tests that show highly significant sex differences that are stable across age, at least after puberty, and have not decreased in recent years. Uh, in this case, the test, there is the advantage goes to the men, although, as I mentioned, the advantage goes to women in other uh, kinds of spatial ability. But in mental rotation, spatial perception, and spatial visualization, uh, there are sex differences in tipping in the male direction. Now, does this have any relevance to scientific achievement? Well, we don't really know for sure, but there's some reason to think that it is, that uh, three-dimensional uh, spatial visualization is correlated with mathematical problem solving, and it figures prominently in the uh, memoirs and introspections of most uh, creative physicists and chemists, uh, including Faraday, Maxwell, Tesla, Kekulé, uh, and Lawrence, all of whom claim to have hit upon their discoveries by uh, dynamic uh, visual imagery and only later set them down in equations. A typical quote is as follows, the psychical entities which seem to serve as elements in my thought are certain signs and more or less clear images which can be voluntarily reproduced and combined. This combinatory play seems to be the essential feature in productive thought before there is any connection with logical construction in words or other kinds of signs. Uh, and that is a quote from a fairly well-known scientist. Uh, mathematical reasoning. Um, girls and women get better school grades in mathematics and pretty much everything else these days. Um, and women are better at mathematical calculation. But uh, consistently, men uh, score at least statistically better on mathematical word problems and on tests of mathematical reasoning. Um, again, the, a meta-analysis, 254 data sets, 3 million subjects shows no significant difference in childhood. This is a difference that emerges uh, uh, around puberty. But there are sizable differences in adolescence and adulthood, especially in high-end samples. Um, here is a, an example of the uh, SAT mathematical uh, score where there is about a 40-point difference in favor of men that's pretty much consistent from 1972 to uh, 1997. In the st study of mathematically precocious youth in which uh, seventh graders were given the SAT, which of course ordinarily is administered only to college-bound uh, kids who are much older, um, the ratio of those scoring over 700 is uh, 2.8 to 1, male to female. And uh, admittedly and interestingly, that's down from uh, 25 years ago when it was a 13 to 1 ratio. And perhaps we can discuss some of the reasons. Uh, above, uh, at the 760 cutoff, the ratio uh, nowadays is 7 to 1, male to female. Now, why is there a discrepancy with grades? Um, do SATs and other tests of mathematical reasoning underpredict grades, or do grades overpredict high-end aptitude? Um, at the Radcliffe Forum, uh, Liz was very explicit in which side she takes, saying that the tests are no good, unquote. Well, one question is, why does every ma major graduate program, including MIT and Harvard, the very departments where Liz and I selected our graduate students by looking at GRE scores, still use them if they are so useless? And I think the reason is that compared to school grades in which you uh, are often, which often are affected by homework, by solving the kind of problems that have already been presented in lecture and textbooks, the aptitude tests are designed 
to test the application, the application of mathematical knowledge to unfamiliar problems, which is, of course, the way that math is used in actually doing math and science. Uh, and in fact, I think contrary to popular opinion of uh, Liz and uh, many intellectuals, uh, the tests are very good. There is an enormous amount of data on the predictive uh, power of SAT tests. Uh, among people in science careers, they overwhelmingly score in the 90th percentile in the uh, SAT or GRAE math, uh, and they predict earnings, occupational choice, doctoral degrees, the prestige of one's degree, uh, have the probability of having a tenure-track position, and number of patents. Moreover, this predictive power is the same for men and women. As for why there is that underprediction, slight underprediction, one tenth of a standard deviation in undergraduate grades, uh, the um, uh, College Board did do a study on that, and they were able to explain it by a combination of the choice of major, which differs among sexes, and the greater conscientiousness of women solving that mystery. Finally, there's variability. Uh, here it's crucial to, uh, because estimates of variance depend on the tails of the distribution, which by definition are uh, less numerous, uh, and uh, since people at the tails are likely to be weeded out of many surveys for various reasons. It's important uh, to have large representative samples from national populations. And for this, the gold standard is the science paper by Novell and Hedges uh, with six large stratified probability samples in which they found that in 35 out, of 35, uh, 35 out of 37 tests, including all of the ones in math, space, and science, the male variance was greater than the female variance. One other uh, gold standard data set is um, this graph of where the entire population of Scotland was given an intelligence test. Uh, what we have here, this is IQ where the mean is, a, is 100, and uh, this is the proportion of men and the proportion of women. And as you can see, there's a very orderly finding in the middle part of the range uh, females predominate at both extremes, males slightly predominate. Needless to say, there's a large percentage of women at both ends as well, but there is also a sex difference. Now, the fact that these differences exist does not mean that they are innate. And this, of course, is a much more difficult question to answer. Uh, to uh, a prelude is that um, nature and nurture are not alternatives. It is possible that the answer involves uh, some of each. Uh, but I think that there are 10 kinds of evidence that at least suggest that the contribution of biology is greater than zero, though it is certainly nowhere near 100%. First is that there are lots of mechanisms, biological mechanisms by which a sex difference uh, could occur. There are large differences in uh, sex hormones in men and women, especially prenatally in the first six months of life and in uh, adolescence after puberty. There are receptors for hormones all over the brain, including the cerebral cortex. There are many small differences that have been noted in men's and women's brains, including the uh, so overall size of the brain, even correcting for body size, and the density of cortical neurons, cortical asymmetry, hypothalamic nuclei, and a number of others. Many uh, sex differences, uh, certainly some, maybe all, are universal. The idea that there are cultures out there somewhere in which everything is the reverse of here uh, turns out to be a, a myth. Um, in Human Universals, the anthropologist Donald Brown surveying this literature points out that in all cultures, men and women are seen as having different natures, that there's a greater involvement of women in direct childcare, more uh, competitiveness in various measures uh, for men than women, and a greater spatial range uh, of men compared to women. In uh, personality, uh, there was a, at least a cross-national sample. Uh, in Feingold's meta-analysis, he noted gender differences in personality that are consistent across ages, years of data collection, educational levels, and nations. In terms of uh, spatial and math abilities, I think we have less data. And uh, the, the honest answer is that we don't have cro true cross-cultural surveys, although we do have cross-national surveys. Uh, David Geary and uh, Catherine DeSoto uh, found a, the expected sex difference in mental rotation in 10 European countries, Ghana, Turkey, and China. And Diane Halpern, analyzing results from seven uh, uh, country, uh, 10 countries, said that the majority of the findings show amazing cross-cultural consistency when comparing males and females on cognitive tests. Stability over time. In life interests and personality, there's been little or no change despite two generations of uh, second wave of feminism. 
Um, there is also uh, famously resistance to change in communities that for various ideological reasons were dedicated to stamping out sex differences and found that they were unable to do so. Uh, these include the Israeli kibbutz, uh, various rural American utopian communities of the end of the 19th century, and contemporary androgynous academic couples. Uh, in um, mental rotation, there, the meta-analysis by Foyer et al. found no change over time. In mathematical reasoning, there uh, has been a uh, decline in the difference, uh, although it has certainly not disappeared. Fourth, many of these differences can be seen in other mammals, suggesting that it's unlikely that the difference was arbitrarily replicated in humans. There is a big difference in many mammals between men and, uh, males and females in aggression, uh, in investment in offspring, in aggressive play versus play parenting, in the range size and also the spatial ability, such as solving mazes, at least in polygynous species, uh, like, like uh, as humans are, and even in a number of primate species, an interest in physical objects versus conspecifics as seen in patterns of juvenile play. Even baby vervet monkeys prefer, uh, the males prefer to, to uh, play with trucks and the uh, females with uh, other toys. Um, many of these em emerge in early childhood. Uh, in the literature, there's a, uh, it's said that there is a technical term for people who believe that boys and girls are indistinguishable and are molded into their, nat their different natures by parental socialization. The term for such people is childless. Uh, <laughs> some differences uh, are, seem to emerge even in the first week of life. Um, girls respond more to sounds of distress. Girls make more eye contact. And in a study that I know that Liz disputes that I hope we'll talk about, there's uh, one study uh, claiming that newborns, uh, the boys are more interested in physical objects, the girls in uh, people, or at least in a face. A uh, little later, there are vast and robust uh, sex differences all over the world. Boys far more often than girls engage in rough and tumble play involving ag aggression, physical activity, and competition. Girls more, more often in cooperative play. Uh, girls engage much more often in play parenting. And uh, yes, it, it really is true that uh, boys will turn anything into a vehicle or a weapon, and uh, girls will turn things into dolls. Uh, there are differences in intuitive psychology, how well kids can read each one another's minds. Uh, there are a number of um, documentations of a uh, sex difference in solving the false belief task uh, and in interpreting the mental states of characters in stories in favor of uh, girls. Um, sixth, genetic boys brought up as girls. They're uh, in a famous case, sometimes called the John Joan case, a uh, one member of a pair of identical twin boys uh, lost his penis in a botched circumcision. I was relieved to find that this was not done by a moil, but by a bungling uh, surgeon. The, um, under advice from the uh, gender psychologists of, of the time, the parents agreed to have the boy castrated, given uh, female-specific uh, hormones, and brought up as a girl. This uh, was hidden from him until he was 14. Uh, when I was an undergraduate, in undergraduate, this case was taught to me as an instance of how uh, gender roles are completely socially acquired. But uh, it turned out that the uh, facts had been suppressed. And when he was, this uh, boy was revisited, it turned out that right from uh, the earliest ages, he uh, was um, exhibited male-specific patterns. Uh, aggression and rough and tumble play, exactly characteristic of boys, a greater interest in things uh, and, than uh, people. Uh, at the age of 14, suffering from depression, his father finally uh, told him the truth. He underwent further surgery, married a woman, uh, adopted some children, and got a job in a slaughterhouse. Uh, <laughs> Now, this is not just a, a single instance. Uh, in the condition called cloacal extrophy, uh, genetic boys are sometimes born without normal male genitalia. And when they have been, uh, again, castrated uh, and uh, brought up as girls, in 25 out of 25 documented instances, they uh, felt that they were boys trapped in girls' bodies and showed male-specific patterns of rough-and-tumble play and uh, so on. <laughs> 
Uh, seven, lack of differential treatment by parents and teachers. In a, this is, these two findings surprise a lot of people. Um, one is that if you, uh, in, Litton and Romney did a meta-analysis of sex-specific socialization involving 172 studies, 28,000 uh, children looking at both reports and direct observations of how pa parents treat their sons and daughters, and found few or no differences among contemporary Americans. Uh, and in particular, there was no difference in the two categories of encouraging achievement and encouraging achievement in mathematics. Um, also, there's a widespread myth that uh, teachers are in, who, of course, are still disproportionately female are actually dupes in perpetuating gender in inequities in uh, failing to call on girls and otherwise having low expectations of their performance. In fact, uh, Jessamyn Eccles, in a study of 100 teachers and 1,800 students, concluded that teachers seem to be basing their perceptions of students on those students' actual performance and motivation. Um, studies of prenatal sex hormones, the uh, mechanism that makes boys boys and girls girls in the first place, there is some evidence, although admittedly um, uh, squishy in parts, that uh, this makes a difference even within a social gender. In the condition called congenital adrenal hyperplasia, uh, girls are uh, in utero are subjected to uh, a, an increased dose of androgens, later uh, um, nullified postnatally, but when they grow up, they have uh, male typical toy preferences compared to uh, other girls in terms of uh, trucks and uh, guns. Male typical play patterns, more competitive, less cooperative. Male typical occupational preferences. Uh, however, uh, the research on their spatial uh, abilities is inconclusive, and I uh, will not be willing to say that uh, there's been a good demonstration that they have male typical patterns of spatial cognition. Um, similarly, variations in fetal testosterone uh, studied in various ways show that fetal testosterone has a um, curvilinear relationship to uh, reduced eye contact and face perception at 12 months, reduced vocabulary at 18 months, greater, uh, um, reduced social skills and, and greater narrowness of interest at 48 months, and an uh, enhanced mental rotation in the school age years. Um, circulating sex hormones, I'm going to go over this slide pretty quickly because uh, I think the literature is uh, a bit of a mess. It's possible that uh, all of it is uh, bogus. I suspect that, uh, that there is something to be salvaged uh, uh, from, it, from this somewhat contradictory literature, uh, but, uh, but I will admit that it is, does not present a uh, perfectly clear picture. Nonetheless, there are many studies showing that a normal to low male range of testosterone is associated with better spatial abilities in a variety of ways in which hormones are compared or manipulated, and some evidence disputed that there are uh, statistical changes in the uh, strengths and, and uh, weaknesses in cognition of women during the uh, menstrual cycle, paralleling the changes in uh, men during the daily and seasonal cycles. Uh, the last bit of evidence is uh, on imprinted X chromosomes. Um, that there, it turns out, uh, it's been discovered that there's an entirely separate genetic system capable of implementing uh, sex differences in a variety of uh, uh, animals that uh, David Haig here has studied. In the condition called Turner syndrome, a child uh, has just one X chromosome but can get it either from her mother or her father. When she inherits an X that is specific to girls, uh, she is on average better at reading emotions, at body language, at reading faces, uh, better vocabulary, and better social skills. Um, just one note on, st on uh, stereotypes, and then I'll, um, I'll end. Um, are these stereotypes? Well, many of them are, although I must say not all, such as female abilities in uh, spatial memory, mathematical calculation, and so on. There seems to be a widespread uh, assumption in much of this discussion that if there is a stereotype, that explains a difference as being the cause of differential expectations. But of course, the causal arrow could go in either direction. Stereotypes might reflect differences. And in fact, there's an enormous literature in cognitive psychology that says that people are good intuitive statisticians and that their prototypes and conceptual categories track the statistics of the natural world pretty well. And that is, uh, just as an, uh, an example, we do have a stereotype that basketball players are taller on average than jockeys, but it certainly doesn't mean that our stereotypes cause that difference in height. Likewise, uh, Alice Eagley and uh, Jessamyn Eccles have shown that uh, most of people's gender stereotypes are in fact pretty accurate. Indeed, the error is in the direction of underpredicting sex differences.
So to sum up, I think there's more than a shred of evidence for sex differences that are relevant to statistical gender disparities in elite science departments. There are reliable average differences in life priorities, interest in people versus things, risk-seeking, spatial transformations, and mathematical reasoning, uh, and variability in these traits. Uh, there are 10 kinds of evidence that suggest that the differences are not completely explained by socialization and bias, although they uh, surely are in part. And just to give a couple of concluding thoughts, none of this, I think, it provides any grounds for ignoring the biases and barriers that keep women out of science. As long as we keep in mind the distinction between fairness on the one hand and sameness on the other, they are different things. I'll give the final word to Gloria Steinem, who said that there are very few jobs that actually require a penis or a vagina, and all the other jobs should be open to both sexes. Thank you very much. <laughs> How's that? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, thanks to David. Thanks especially to Steve. I'm really glad we're able to uh, have this debate. I've uh, been looking forward to it. Um, there, oops, here's the first slide. I wanted to start by talking about some points of agreement between uh, Steve and me. And as he suggested in the introduction, there's actually many. I think if we got away from the topic of sex and science, uh, we'd be hard pressed to find issues that, uh, that we disagree on. Uh, this is not working. I better stay here. Uh, but here are a few of the points of agreement that I think are particularly relevant to the discussions that have been going around over the last few months. First of all, we agree that uh, both our society in general and our universities in particular are going to be healthiest if all opinions can be put on the table and debated on their merits. Uh, we also agree that claims concerning sex differences are empirical. They should be evaluated by evidence. And we'll all be a lot happier and live a lot longer if we can try to undertake that evaluation as dispassionately and rationally as possible. We agree that the mind is not a blank slate. In fact, um, uh, probably one of the deepest things that Steve and I agree on is that there is such a thing as human nature, and it can be a fabulously fascinating and exhilarating experience to uh, ask what uh, our human nature is like. And finally, I think we agree that the role of scientists in society is actually a rather humble one. What scientists do is try to find things out. Uh, the much more difficult questions of deciding how to use that information, how to live our lives, how to structure our societies, those are not questions that scientists can answer. Those are questions that uh, everybody needs to participate in. So what do we disagree on? We disagree on the answer to the question, why in the world is it that women are as scarce as hen's teeth on Harvard's uh, mathematics faculty and other uh, similar institutions. Now, in the debate that's been going around, two classes of factors have been appealed to to uh, account for this difference. One class are social forces, including overt uh, and covert discrimination, and other social forces that shape men and women uh, to be capable of different things, develop different skills, uh, develop different priorities. And the other class of factors are uh, uh, genetic in nature, genetic differences between men and women that lead men and women to have different capacities and to want different things. Now, in his book, The Blank Slate, and again uh, today, Steve argued <laughs> that uh, social forces are very overrated as causes of gender differences. Discrimination used to be a big deal. It's much less of a big deal now. Differential treatment, I don't need to repeat his talk to you. Uh, intrinsic differences in aptitude are a larger factor, and intrinsic differences in motives, like you didn't really order these, but I think you would say it's the biggest factor of all, certainly all the examples, most of the examples that Steve gave with the strongest evidence, concerned uh, what he takes to be biologically based differences in motives. Now, my own view is somewhat different. <laughs> Uh, I think the big uh, uh, culprits here, the big forces causing this gap are indeed uh, those social factors. Uh, I think there are, there are no differences. I'll make all those radical statements uh, Steve uh, attributed to me. There are no differences in overall intrinsic aptitude for science and mathematics among women and men. Notice what this is not saying. 
It is not saying the genders are indistinguishable. It's not saying men and women are alike in every way. It's not even saying that men and women have identical cognitive profiles. What it's saying is that when you add up all the things that men are good at and all the things that women are good at, you see no evidence for an overall advantage for men that's going to put more men at the top of the fields of math and science and other fields if discrimination and uh, so other social factors did not exist. So the argument there is no differences, and I stand by uh, that argument. On the issue of intrinsic motives, I think we're not in a position to know at this point whether the different things that men and women often statistically, as Steve was saying, say they want are stemming wholly from social forces or in part from biological forces. I don't think we can know that now. But what I want to do with my 30 minutes is start with the issue that's clearly the biggest source of debate between Steve and me. Uh, this issue of uh, uh, differences in intrinsic aptitude, do they exist or not, and what are they? Uh, there's another reason for me to do that. Uh, this is the only uh, force among everything on this list that my own work uh, and kind of professional knowledge has any bearing on whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> then I want to turn to the social uh, forces uh, as a lay person, as it were, on the outside looking at them, because I do think that they are, are exerting the biggest effects here and say something about them. And then finally, if I haven't run hopelessly over time, I'll come back to this question of motives and hope, and I imagine we'll both come back to it when we get to our uh, discussion. Now, over the last two, three months, whatever it's been, uh, there have been three kinds of arguments advanced uh, in defense of the idea that men have greater aptitude, cognitive aptitude for science than women. The first argument is that from birth, there's a difference in interest. And Steve actually brought this up a number of times. Boys are predisposed to be interested in objects and the mechanical world. Girls are predisposed to be interested in people and emotions. And this predisposition to figure out the mechanics of the world sets boys on a path that makes them more likely to become scientists or uh, mathematicians. The second argument is that, as Galileo told us, the, the, the pursuit of science is conducted in the language of mathematics. Mathematics is the key ingredient to science. And the second claim is that males are intrinsically better at mathematical reasoning. They've got better uh, mathematical abilities. And a subclaim to this, which Steve appealed to, uh, better at spatial reasoning. And the third claim, which Steve, Steve also appealed to, uh, that men show greater variability than women. And as a result, there are more men at the extreme upper end of the ability distribution from which our scientists and mathematicians are going to come. Let me take these claims uh, one by one. So the first claim, as Steve said, has gained new currency recently from the work of Simon Baron Cohen. It's actually a very old idea, but here's some of the new language in which uh, Baron Cohen puts it. He says that males are innately predisposed to learn about objects and mechanical relationships, and this sets them on a path toward becoming what he calls systematizers. Females, on the other hand, are innately predisposed to learn about people and their expressions of emotion, and this, this puts them on a path of development toward becoming what he calls empathizers. Now, if systematizing is at the heart of math and science, this leads to the conclusion that uh, boys from this initial predisposition are more apt uh, to uh, develop the knowledge and skills that will lead to math and science. Now, to anyone uh, who's as old as I am and have been following the literature on sex differences uh, for long enough, this may seem like a surprising claim. The, the classic reference on uh, the nature and development of sex differences is the book of Eleanor McAbee and Carol Jacklin that came out in the uh, early to mid-70s, uh, where they reviewed a huge literature on all different kinds of aspects of sex differences. They provided evidence for all sorts of reliable sex differences, looking across large numbers of studies. But they also came to the conclusion that certain ideas about differences between the genders were a myth. And at the very top of their list of mythical ideas was this idea that males are primarily interested in objects and females are primarily interested in people. They went through an enormous old literature where you stuck babies down in front of objects and people, and you saw where they were interested in one or the other, where you looked at kids in playgrounds, and their conclusion was there was no such difference. On the other hand, this, this conclusion was made in the early 70s, and at that time, Although people had done a fair amount of work sticking babies in front of objects and people, we didn't actually know very much 
about what babies understand about objects or people, or how their understanding grows, how it changes, what kinds of things uh, babies are learning about. And since Baron Cohen's claims are really claims about differential predispositions to learn different kinds of things, you could argue that, that they really hadn't been tested in McAvee and Jacqueline's time. So we can ask 30 years later, what does this research show? Well, I'm going to take you on a whirlwind tour of 30 years of research in one PowerPoint slide. <laughs> it goes roughly like this. Uh, from birth, babies can see objects. They know where one object ends and the, uh, and the next one begins. Their vision is horrendously bad. They can't see objects as well as you can, even as well as I can. Uh, but as they're growing, their object perception becomes richer, more differentiated. Uh, it improves a lot over infancy. But it starts out, they started out already with some rudimentary abilities. Babies also start out with rudimentary abilities to represent that an object continues to exist when it's out of view and to hold on to those representations, though they get much better at holding on to them for longer and over more complicated kinds of changes as they grow. Babies also make basic inferences about object motions, things like inferences like uh, what do you have to do to an object to set it in motion? You have to hit it. The force with which you hit it determines the force with which it moves, and so forth. These inferences undergo very regular, uh, these patterns of inferences undergo regular developmental change over the infancy period. But even uh, very early on, they're starting to reason about objects in motion. Now, in each case, each of these cases, there are systematic developmental changes. Uh, They've been traced in some cases to maturational changes, in other cases specifically to learning, and there's variability. And because there's variability, we can ask, what happens when we compare the abilities of male infants to the abilities of females? Do we see sex differences? And the work gives a clear answer to that question. We don't. Male and female infants are equally interested in objects. Male and female infants make the same inferences about object motion at the same time in development. They learn, they learn the same uh, things about object mechanics at the same time. If you look across very large numbers of studies, you'll occasionally find a study that favors one sex over the other, actually more often girls, who might learn that the force with which you hit something influences the force at which it moves a month earlier than boys do. But these differences are small and scattered, and for the most part, what you see is very high convergence across these studies. And these common paths of learning continue through the preschool years as kids start manipulating objects, figuring out, can I get this rectangular block into this circular hole. If you look at differences in rates at which boys and girls figure these things out, you don't find any differences. So we see equal developmental paths there. And I think this supports a conclusion that's actually really important. In all of this discussion of sex differences, I think we need to spend a little time asking what's common across the two sexes. One thing that's common is we don't divide up the labor of understanding the world as infants with males focusing on the mechanical world and females focusing on people and emotions. Males and females are both interested both in objects and in emotions. They're learning about both of them. They're not dividing that cognitive labor. The conclusions that McAbee and Jacqueline drew in the early 1970s have been very well supported by research since that time. Let me turn to the second claim that it's all very well and good that we've got equal abilities to under, to develop intuitive understanding of the physical world. But formal math and science isn't really about building on your intuitions. It's about using mathematics to come up with new characterizations of the world and new principles to understand its functioning. So maybe males have an edge in scientific and mathematical reasoning because there's an intrinsic difference in the male talent for mathematics. Now, as Steve said, Formal mathematics is not something we could have evolved the ability to do. It's a very recent accomplishment. All those animals out there showing sex differences and aggression and so forth, they're not doing formal math, they're not doing formal science. Neither are humans back in the Pleistocene. These are rather recent uh, uh, developments. And what that means is that if we have a biological basis for our mathematical reasoning abilities, it must be because we're endowed with biological systems that evolved for other purposes, but that we've been able to harness for the new purpose of representing and manipulating numbers, geometry, spatial relationships, and so forth. Now, a lot of research 
from intersecting uh, fields of cognitive neuroscience, neuropsychology, cognitive psychology, and cognitive development provide evidence for five what I would call core systems at the foundations of mathematical reasoning. The first is a system for representing small, exact numbers of objects, the difference between one and two and three. And this is a system that emerges and is, in, as, is functional in human infants about as early as five months of age, continues to be present in adults. The second is a system for discriminating large approximate numerical magnitudes, the difference between a set of about 10 things and a set of about 20 things. That also emerges early in infancy, four or five months, uh, and continues to be present and functional and used by us as adults. The third is the system that's probably the first serious, uniquely human foundation for numerical abilities, the system of natural number concepts that we construct as children when we learn verbal counting. And that construction takes place between about the ages of two and a half and four years of age. Uh, and the last two systems are systems that we first see children using when they navigate. One is a system for representing the geometry of the surrounding layout that you can use to find objects that are hidden in particular locations with respect to the shape of a room. The other is uh, a system for representing landmark objects which uh, children will use uh, to locate objects when they're hidden directly in environments. Now all of these abilities have been studied uh, quite extensively in large numbers of male and female infants, and so we can ask in each case, are there sex differences in the development of any of these systems at the foundations of mathematical thinking? And again, the answer is no. I want to show you data from just two cases, which I think, from Steve's review of the differences among adults, might seem like the most relevant cases. So the first is the development of natural number concepts. Now I told you these are constructed by children between about the ages of two and a half and four. If you look at kids, though, at any particular time slice of development, you'll find a lot of variability. So for example, between the ages of three and three and a half, you'll find some children who have only figured out the meaning of the word one and can only have some symbolic understanding of the concept one versus all other numbers. But at that same age, you'll find other kids who figured out the meanings of all the words in the count list up to 10 or 20 or more and can use all of them in a meaningful way. And most of the kids will be somewhere in between. They will have figured out the first two symbols or the first three and so forth. But when you now break children's performance down by sex, you see no hint of a difference between the two sexes, no hint of a superiority of men in construct males in constructing natural number concepts. The other example I want to show you comes from these studies that are, I think, the closest thing in a uh, preschool child to the mental rotation tasks that Steve described that are conducted with adults. In these studies, a child's put in a room of a given shape, something's hidden in a corner, and then their eyes are closed and they're spun around. So what they have to do is remember the shape of the room, open their eyes, retrieve that memory of the shape of the room, and now figure out from the new direction in which they're facing how they have to rotate themselves to get back to the object where it was hidden before. Now, if you test a group of four-year-olds, you find they're able to do this task well above chance. Most of them are not perfect. You get a range of performance, and when you break that performance down by gender, again, not a hint of an advantage for boys or for girls. So these findings and others seem to me to support some important points. The first point is that indeed there is a biological foundation to mathematical and scientific reasoning. We're endowed with core knowledge systems that emerge prior to any formal instruction in young children and that serve as a basis for mathematical uh, thinking. But these systems seem to develop equally in males and females. Now about 10 years ago, Steve's already referred to the evolutionary psychologist uh, and sex difference researcher David Geary, he reviewed the literature that was available at that time and concluded on that basis that there were no differences in what he calls primary abilities, what I call core systems uh, underlying mathematics. And I think what we've learned in the last 10 years or so continues to support that conclusion. Now, sex differences do emerge at older ages. Remember, the debate is not, are there sex differences? The debate is, do they add up to an advantage for one sex over the other. So sex differences do emerge later uh, in childhood. As Steve said, because they emerge late, it's very hard to tease apart their biological and social uh, sources. But before we attempt that task, let's ask what the differences are. 
I think the following is a fair statement, both of some of the differences that Steve described and of some others. When, you're, when people are presented with a complex task that can be solved through multiple different strategies, males and females will sometimes differ in the strategy that they prefer. For example, if I give you a task that can only be solved by representing the geometry of the layout, we will not see a difference between men and women. But if I give you a task that could be accomplished either by representing geometry or by representing individual landmarks, we may see a sex difference, where girls will be more likely to rely on the landmarks, girls are women, and men more likely to rely on the geometry. To take another task, that mental rotation task that Steve told you about, when you have to compare the shapes of two objects at different orientations, there's two different strategies you can use to do that. You can attempt a holistic rotation in your mind of one of the objects into registration with the other, or you can do point-by-point -point featural comparisons of the two. Men are more likely to do the first, women are somewhat more likely to do the second. Finally, in those uh, mathematical word problems that figure so strongly on the uh, SATM, the uh, test that Steve's already been talking about, very often they allow multiple solutions. And both item analyses and studies of high school students engaged in the act of solving those problems, taking uh, model SAT tests, suggest that when you've got the choice of solving a problem by plugging in a formula, or by doing Venn diagram-like spatial reasoning, uh, relatively more girls will tend to do the first and relatively more boys will tend to do the second. Now, because of these differences, males and females will sometimes show differing cognitive profiles on timed tasks where uh, uh, what's crucial is you've got to solve something fast, and some strategies are going to be faster than others. So in particular, uh, as Steve said, uh, females will be better at some verbal, mathematical, and spatial tasks, and males will be better at other verbal, mathematical, and spatial tasks. Now notice, this pattern of different profiles is not well captured by the generalization that's often bandied about in the popular press, that women are, are verbal and men are spatial. There doesn't seem to be any more evidence for that than there was for the, uh, as McAfee and Jacqueline said, for the idea of, you know, women are social and men are object-oriented. Uh, Rather, the differences are more subtle. But still, it's a fair question. It's an empirical question. For all my, the certainty of the quotes that you uh, put up online, I'm completely committed that this is an empirical question. Does one of these two profiles foster better learning of math than the other? And in particular, is this male profile a better one to have if you're going to engage in high-level mathematical reasoning. Well, at this point, we have to ask ourselves a question that's been much uh, discussed in the literature on mathematics education and mathematical testing. Many publications from the Educational Testing Service on this, and a whole new book that just came out that's devoted to this question. The question is, by what yardstick can we decide whether a male profile or a female profile, whether a group of men or a group of women are better at math? Now, some people, Steve seemed to be doing this, suggest that we look at how people perform on the SATM, the quantitative part of the scholastic assessment test. But as people uh, 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 have often argued, there's a problem of circularity with that decision. Here's the problem. If you look at the SAT test, it's composed of a whole bunch of different types of items. Now, some of those items are solved better by females. Some of those items are solved better by males. So the people who make the test now have a problem that they have to solve. How many of each type of item should they be putting in that test? Depending on how they answer that problem, they will create a test that makes women look like great mathematicians or a test that makes men look like great mathematicians. What's the right solution? Well, as I said, there are books that are devoted to this question, much debate, but there seems to be a consensus about the following point. The only way to come up with a test that's fair is to develop an independent understanding of what mathematical aptitude is and how it's distributed between men and women. But if that's true, then we can't use performance on the current or some other version of the SAT to give us that understanding. We've got to get that understanding in some other way. So how are we going to get it? Well, another possibility, and Steve showed data on this, is to look at job outcomes. Maybe the people who are better at mathematics are the people who go into more mathematically intensive jobs. But here, there's actually two problems. The first problem is, 
how you answer the, if you, if you base your answer as to who's more mathematically talented on which jobs they go into, the answer you get is going to depend on which mathematically intensive jobs you use. If you choose engineering as your example of a mathematically intensive job, you will conclude, or actually any of the ones Steve had on the board, you will conclude that men are better at math because there's more men who become engineers. If you use accounting as your example of a math intensive job, you will say that women are better at math because, believe it or not, uh, there are more women accountants out there working today in that highly social, people-oriented field. More women than men. 57% for accountants are women. So which job are we going to pick to decide where's the real mathematical talent? I think that what these two examples suggest, though, is a deeper problem with using job outcomes as our measure of mathematical talent. Surely you've got to be good at math to go into a mathematic mathematically intensive job. But talent at mathematics is not sufficient to account for job selection. It's one of the forces at work, but there's going to be many other forces at work too. It can't be our gold standards for mathematical ability. So what can be? I would like to suggest that the following is the ideal experiment to conduct. What we want to do is we want to take a large number of male students and a large number of female students who have equal educational background and we want to present them with the kinds of tasks that real mathematicians face. We want to give them new mathematical material that they have not yet mastered. We want to allow them to learn it over a, an extended period of time, the kinds of time scales that real mathematicians work on. And we want to ask, how well do they master this material? Now, the good news is this experiment is done all the time. It's called high school and college. <laughs> Here's the way it comes out. In high school, girls now take about half of the math classes, including the most advanced ones, and they get better grades. In college, women earn almost half of the bachelor's degrees in mathematics, another statistic that surprised me as I started getting into this. And men and women get equal grades, and uh, uh, I have to respectfully disagree with one thing that Steve said. Men and women get equal grades even when you equate for the institutions, you only compare people within a single institution, within a single math class, so you're comparing two people both taking the engineering version of calculus or differential geometry, uh, equating for classes and grades, they're getting equal grades um, uh, across these institutions. Now, I think the outcome of this large-scale experiment gives us every reason to conclude that men and women have equal talent for mathematics. And here I'd also like to quote Diane Halpern. Yes, Diane Halpern reviews much evidence for sex differences, but her conclusion is differences are not deficiencies. Men and women have equal talent overall. They're equally intelligent, as Steve said, and in uh, uh, an article in this book in 2005, she concludes they have equal aptitude for mathematics. So uh, I think uh, that's uh, the evidence clearly, I think, is on that side of saying, yes, there are these differences, but they don't add up to an overall advantage for one sex over the other. But let me turn to the third claim, uh, that men show greater variability, perhaps in general, perhaps just in uh, quantitative um, abilities in particular. And so there's more of them at the upper end of the ability distribution. I can probably go quickly here because Steve has already told you about the work of Camilla Benbow and Julian Stanley, the study of um, mathematically precocious youth focusing on these kids who are screened at age 13 and then put in intensive accelerated programs and then followed up afterwards um, to see uh, what they're able to achieve in mathematics. Now, as Steve said, when they were screened at age 13 by the same SAT test, there were many more boys than girls who scored at the very highest levels. And in those days, it was almost 13 to 1 over 12 to 1. As Steve said, the uh, disparities are now um, substantially lower, but there's still a disparity of uh, uh, boys among the very small subset of people from this large, talented sample who score at the very upper end. Now, based on those data, Benbo and Stanley concluded that there are more boys than girls in the pool from whom, from which uh, future mathematicians will be drawn. But notice, there's a problem with this conclusion. It's based entirely on the SATM, okay? Uh, this test where th that's, in need of an ex that's in need of an explanation, that's in need of a foundation, a more firm yardstick for asking what the differences are. Now, 
Fortunately, uh, as you said, the uh, 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 Benbo and Stanley and the Lubinsky uh, group has collected much more data on these mathematically talented boys and girls. And now we're talking not just about the ones who scored at the extreme end on this one timed test, but rather this full sample, much larger sample, including many girls as well as uh, boys who were accelerated and followed over time. Let's look at some of the key things that they found. First of all, they looked at college performance by the talented sample. They found that these youths, once they got to college, took equally demanding math classes, and they majored in math in equal numbers. When you go to physics and engineering versus biology, you see more of the girls majored in biology, more of the boys in physics, as Steve was saying. But in actual mathematics itself, there were uh, equal numbers of uh, girls and boys uh, majoring in math, and they got equal grades. I think this suggests that the SAT is not only underpredicting the performance of college women in general, who are getting equal grades for doing less well on the SAT, it's also underpredicting the college performance of the uh, talented sample at the extreme upper end. The, by the more, most meaningful measures we have, ability to assimilate new challenging material in demanding mathematics classes uh, in top flight institutions where you're majoring in mathematics. By that measure, they're not finding any difference between girls and boys.